Hello, it's a tremendous privilege to have the opportunity to talk with you today. I have been so impressed with how early childhood music educators have handled this last year. You've adapted and adjusted in the face of tremendous adversity and provided fantastic instruction for young children with music. What you do is vitally important. As early childhood music educators, we can play a tremendous role in improving the lives of children and their families and in helping make the world a better place. So what should be our goal as early childhood music educators and how can we be most useful? I'm convinced that the more we do to help our students develop their own musicianship so that they are empowered to express themselves through music, the better. I think back for my own story. I'm a French hornist. I was also a singer and a pianist, and my mother and father were both very musical. In fact, my mom was a music teacher. But I was only a recreative musician. I interpreted the work of others, the music of others. I never created my own music. I desperately wish that I'd been given the opportunity to learn to express and create my own ideas musically but that was never the case in all of my music instruction until I was a doctoral student. Yet I see children who have graduated from our early childhood music program who are very different types of musicians than I am. The program has been around long enough now so that I've followed actually some of them all the way into and through college. They're performers, but they're also composers. They're singer-songwriters, they're music producers, they're rock band musicians. They're creative musicians making their own music. Why is this? Why are the students in the early childhood music program getting to be musicians in ways that I never got to be, in spite of all of the opportunities that I had to learn musically? I find myself thinking about how we learn language and about the parallels between music and language learning. So let's think about language for a second. With language, we begin the process informally. Kids have exposure to a rich language environment and it helps them develop a sense of syntax and a rich listening and speaking vocabulary. They're not taught to listen, they're not taught to speak. They do that as a result of immersion in a rich environment. They listen to and explore sounds before they begin formally speaking. And learning language is a social process. It's really important, in fact, to have adults and siblings and people that they care about reacting and responding to them with language. We know that if parents respond as if their children had said something when the children are babbling, their language develops better and faster. So, you know, if a child babbles or makes a sound and the parent says, are you telling me you're hungry? Or are you telling me you want your diapers changed? Even though the child was really not trying to express something specific, that social interaction, that interchange between the child and the parent has an important effect and plays a role in language learning. I want to share a video for you of a father and his child. And in this video, the father is really responding as if the child is saying important things. So share this. You may have seen it already. It went viral. Is that right? Yes. Yes. Okay. Did you understand it though? Yeah. No. Okay. All right. <laughs> Oh, no, not, not this one. This is, this is the grand finale of the... Of the okay, the last Yeah, that's the last one. You want to go That's what I was wondering. I don't know what they're going to do next season because they did some stuff this time. Um, exactly what I was thinking. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, don't bring that again. You know what I'm saying? Don't do the same stuff. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I was thinking that, yeah. Yeah. Like go somewhere else with that, but don't break it here, you know what I'm saying? 
That's what I said. Then it was like, ah, you know what I'm saying? And I was like, what in the world? But don't do that here. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Really? I thought the same thing. <laughs> we think a lot alike, huh? <laughs> That's crazy. Right. Now that is a child who understands the rules of conversation. My turn, your turn, complete with hand gestures. Another important thing that happens as a result of informal music instruction and informal language instruction is that children become hardwired syntactically. When you and I speak, we don't think about the order in which we put the words in our sentences. We have an idea and we have the vocabulary to express that idea and it just comes out. We speak and our ideas are expressed through language. The syntax or the order in which our words are placed in the sentences happens naturally. And that is something that we learned when we were very young through informal language exposure. So we need to provide our children musically opportunities to develop that syntactical structure as well. With language, children develop a vocabulary of words. And in fact, we know that the better the vocabulary with which they are surrounded, the better their language skills develop. So when we have parents who use their full, rich vocabulary with their children, those children develop better language skills, better speaking skills, better listening skills, eventually better reading and writing skills. So that language and that vocabulary piece is really important. Lots of informal readiness for reading and writing. Children can think in language and speak language and listen to language before they begin to firm formally learn to read and write language. So what does this mean for us as music educators? I believe that it gives us guiding principles for our practice, things that we need to consider when we design and plan our instruction for young children musically. We have to begin informally immersing children in a rich music environment. Because by doing that, we help them develop a sense of music syntax. They hear where home is. They hear where the tonic or the resting tone is. They become aware of harmonic structure. They begin to feel the beat in their bodies. Feel the meter in their bodies. We need to help them develop a rich music vocabulary through listening and exploring. And we do that by helping them hear and exposing them to a huge vocabulary of tonalities and meters, of tonal and rhythm patterns. And third, we need to give them an opportunity to create and express themselves musically. So we need to help them develop a sense of music syntax, we need to help them develop a rich music vocabulary. And we need to give them an opportunity to create, explore, and express. So the rest of the time together will be spent giving you ideas and examples of what this might look like in practice. If you're in a space or a situation that allows it, move when I move, just copy my movement. There'll also be times when I ask you to do something vocally. Make sure that your mics are turned off so that the time lag doesn't create issues for us. So let's start with helping students develop a sense of syntax. Tonally, we do that by immersing them in lots of music, helping them hear lots of syntactical systems, but also by helping them hear and helping them focus on tonic, which is home, the resting tone, and on dominant, which are sort of the two gateposts of many or most tonalities. So I'm going to start with an activity that's a real favorite in my classroom. 
And I do this with my birth, I would say through three-year-olds. And you need to be really conscious of how they're interacting with you. You don't want to get in their personal space to the point that they feel uncomfortable. But we know from research that if you can develop a relationship with children that allows you to touch them, it actually helps with their music learning. Christina Hornbach's dissertation showed that. So listen to my song for a minute. You notice me moving with flow, and I'll explain more of that about why I do that in a minute. But bum is the resting tone, it's the tonic of this song. So what I do with this song is I emphasize the tonic by buzzing the children's bellies. And now I'll walk up to a child and go <gasps> with their belly being my hand. Now, if a child shows me in any way that they don't want me to invade their space, I don't invade it. What I might do is I might touch, give them lots of space, and touch their toe with one finger. Or if a child even looks sort of concerned about that, I might buzz their parents or their caregiver's belly. Or I might touch their parents or caregiver's foot. So I'm very careful to give them space. But I also have children who will follow me around the room and stick their bellies out in the hopes that I'll buzz them more and more even when it's not their turn. So you need to be sensitive to what's going on. Sometimes I'll buzz my own belly if the child doesn't want me to buzz theirs. So just by buzzing, I will reinforce tonic because I'm buzzing on the resting tone. Bum. And I do that at the end of almost every song. Bum. Bum. Touching the ground on tonic five and one. Pairing that movement with that pattern. Bum. Bum. And eventually what happens is I can go like this. And you'll hear children sing, bum, bum, even without my singing it. So by pairing that movement, you are helping give you tools for moving forward later. So you'll see that my instruction, and you'll see this through a lot of these activities, is disguising and pointing out tonic and dominant in a thousand different ways. And so I want you to sort of be sensitive to that and watch as I teach and do other activities geared toward other things. Ah, she still put tonic and dominant in that. We also know from Denise Gilbo's research that hearing harmonic structures underpinning the melodies helps kids eventually create and helps them develop tonal syntax. So I often will teach the bass lines or the chord roots to parents or assistants, and it gives them something to do and provides harmonic structure for the children to become aware of. Now, some I know some people sometimes complain about parents talking in class. I find if I give them a musical task, 
like singing the chord roots, they're less likely to talk. Listen. Where are the chord roots for the song I'm about to sing? Bum, 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 bum. Can you sing that? Bum, 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 bum. No, you can keep singing that, and I'm going to sing the melody. Ooh, 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 wind is blowing through the trees. Ooh, 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 autumn time is here. So having the parents, having the caregivers, having an assistant sing that chord root bass line helps kids learn to audiate harmonically. So do that with as many songs as possible. In many of the songs in your handout, I actually included the bass line just so it's easier for you. So that bass line hearing audiation and that hearing tonal syntax, that hearing tonic and dominant is really what helps form that sense of tonal syntax. Rhythmically, I, we found that helping kids understand meter, which is metric, that rhythm syntax, and develops in a variety of ways. And one of the ways that we have found to be really helpful in starting this process is to have them move with flow. So that children are moving through the music with their entire bodies, rather than just doing beat. So we move through the music, and then we superimpose beat on our flow. When students, as they are in band or choir rush, it's not that they don't audiate beat. It's that they don't feel the space between the beats. And when you look at a child in its car seat or her, his or their, her or their car seat, a lot of their movement will be flowing movement. So we're building on what children can already do. So, ooh, 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 wind is blowing through the trees. Ooh, time is here. So another song. I made a little bit of a tonal mistake in the beginning. Sorry about that. So I often will, that was moving maybe when I'm seated, I'll move when I'm standing as well. Notice how my hips are involved. My knees, although you can't see them, are involved as well. So eventually, after I do a lot with flow, I'll start adding pulsations. And they can be macro beat pulsations or they can be micro beat pulsations. <laughs> And I'll tell you, if a high school choir or a middle school choir or band is rushing, all you really need to do is get them to stand up and move with flow and flow with pulse, and it will probably take care of the problem. 
So that flow and flow with pulsations. In my infant class, I only do flow. And then as the kids begin to get older and begin to show me that they're flowing with their bodies, I start adding microbeat and macrobeat pulsations. So right now is the minute that I wish we were together because you're going to need to imagine how this feels to some extent because you're not here to hold hands with me. So we also want children to learn to feel beat in their bodies. And I have them do some activities that help them feel beat without creating tension. So pretend I'm holding hands in a circle with a class. Ya da 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 ba da, yum ba da ba da, ya da 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 ba 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 da da, ba da ba da ba da ba da ba da, ya da 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 ba da. So we're all holding hands. We're moving to beat. The children are physically connected with someone who feels beat, even though they may not feel beat yet themselves. So that feeling of beat, but in a really relaxed way. You couldn't see my knees, but they were bending, and I was just relaxed and sort of bouncing to beat. So that physical connection for children with someone who feels beat, and yet without creating tension. Because if you create tension, it actually inhibits their ability to learn to audiate meter rather than helps it. So we're not forcing. If a child doesn't want to engage, the child can watch, and that's absolutely fine. I might even have a child holding hands with a parent and standing on that parent's feet. As the parent rocks and sort of steps back between their, their two feet, alternating feet, so that the child has that physical connection with the parent in a playful way that is engaging and that the child wants to engage with without creating tension. So we also want kids to hear macro beats and micro beats together and in contrast with one another, because that's really where meter resides. If I were just to go, You don't know if I'm in duple or triple meter, because I could be or it's how the macro beat divides into micro beats. So if meter is our most important syntactical structure rhythmically, we need to have both macro beat and micro beat happening at some point for children really to internalize and audiate meter. So I might do a song where I'm doing one thing during one type of section and another thing during another. So listen. I get the parents doing that. So always moving with flow. The song has two main melodic motives. The da -dum. And then a more lyrical one. So during the bouncy one, I'm doing macro beats or I'm doing micro beats, switching between the two each time. And during the lyrical part, I'm moving with flow. So kids get to move with and see flow, macro beats, micro beats, all in the same activity.
with the same song and in the same repertoire. Engine, engine number nine, going down Chicago line. If the train should jump the track, do I get my money back? Ch Keep it going. Engine, engine number nine, going down Chicago line. If the train should jump the track, do I get my money back? So with the chant, I might have them do macro beats first or micro beats first. Either way, they'll find micro beats a little bit easier, but that's not a reason necessarily to do them first. You need to make sure that you do both of them. So I might have them be big trains stomping around the room to macro beats and tiptoeing around the room to micro beats. And then eventually, with an assistant's help, I might have a macro beat train and a micro beat train going on at once. So I'd have engine, engine number nine going down Chicago. Chicago line and the trains would be moving around the room so that a child isn't doing macro beat or micro beat at the same time within themselves at first but we have both of the things happening in the environment so that they're experiencing them at the same time so that experiencing macro beats and micro beats moving from flow to flow with pulsations to feeling beat without creating tension with macro beats and micro beats, hearing macro beats, hearing micro beats, exploring them, experiencing them a lot, to having macro beats and micro beats going at the same time in the environment. So that syntactical structure and that audiation of music tonally with tonic and dominant, with harmonic structure and rhythmically with beat, a uh, flow, beat, macro, micro together so it forms meter really helps them develop that syntactical understanding of music in the same way that they developed that syntactical understanding with language so that they knew the order in which they put their words without having to think about it in a conscious way. But all of the syntactical understanding in the world isn't going to matter unless children have the vocabulary to sort of hang onto those syntactic structures. So we need to help children also develop a rich tonal and rhythmic vocabulary. Listen to my song. So I've just been moving with flow. Notice when I'm giving you verbal instructions, I'm also singing it on tonic. I do that with my kids as well as a way of helping them focus on tonic and dominant as well. So that song was in five and it was in Dorian. And so I'm exposing them to five. I'm exposing them to Dorian. I'm moving with flow. We know that the more tonalities and meters children are engaged in and exposed to and immersed in, the richer their tonal or rhythmic vo vocabulary is. So we don't want to just do major. We don't want to just do minor. We want to do lots and lots of different tonalities, lots and lots of different meters. So they're hearing duple and they're hearing triple and they're hearing things in five. And you know, it may be hard for us because we are carrying a lifetime of major duple baggage. We have heard so much major duple that we have a hard time audiating something that's not in major, a hard time learning something that's not duple or maybe triple. But kids don't have any of that baggage. 
So let's try really hard not to hand them our suitcases and to push ourselves musically to learn songs that are in different tonalities and songs that are in different meters, because that will enrich the musical lives of our children. So lots of, di lots of different tonalities, lots and lots of different meters. I would argue also lots and lots of different musical styles. Because what we want to do as early childhood music educators is build this strong, deep, rich platform that children can use in any way they want as they move forward in their lives musically, whether it be as a musician in a rock band or whether it be with their praise band at church or whether it be playing in band or or orchestra at school, or singing in school choir, or whether it be composing their own works. You know, there are so many musical paths children could take, and we're building a rich foundation for all of those pathways. So by exposing them to all sorts of musical styles when they're very young, we're building that platform wider. We want it to be wide and we want it to be deep. So another thing that helps children develop their vocabularies is exposure to tonal and rhythm patterns. So I engage children a lot in tonal and rhythm patterns in my classes. I have them uh, do patterns in the context of a song. So I might do Wind is blowing through the trees. Ooh, ooh, autumn time is here. And that song's in minor tonality. It's in duple meter. So I could use that song then as a springboard for either minor tonal patterns or duple rhythm patterns. So with the young children, I might stop at my flow after singing the song a couple of times and go ba 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 rhythm patterns ba 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 leaving space in between the patterns because if a child makes a sound during that space I'll echo it and try to engage that child in a conversation rhythmically so two beat patterns, a fancy first beat and just a ba on the second beat, and then space. Three or four patterns, see if there are any responses, moving with flow when I do the patterns. And then, ooh, wind is blowing through the trees. Ooh, ooh, autumn time is here. So using the song then, and maybe an activity with it, to bookend the patterns, which are sandwiched in the middle a little bit. As children get older, rhythmically, I'll start stringing two of those fancy beat, plain beat together. So it's fancy beat, plain beat, fancy beat, plain beat. Eventually, children are going to be musically strong enough and developed enough that you can actually have them echo your patterns formally. Autumn time is here. So when they are already audiating meter, then they can do that 
back and forth, keeping the metric clock ticking. Ooh, wind is blowing through the trees. Ooh, ooh, autumn time is here. Yada. I'm demonstrating some minor tonal patterns, and these are the ones that I do with young children, moving with flow and slipping and sliding, just going in a legato way, ending on one of the pitches of the tonic triad, bum, 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 and doing two or three pitch patterns, legato, moving, sliding between those pitches. Ya -da -da. Ya -da -da. Ya -da. Still leaving space in between and ooh, 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 wind is blowing through the trees. Ooh, 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 autumn time is here. And bookending with the song. As kids get older, I change the patterns. When they start making sounds and start responding to mine, I'll change it to bum, bum. Staccato, short pitches, and bum, bum. One, five, and bum, bum, five, one. When they start echoing that, I'll move to other kinds of patterns like bum, bum, bum. Bum, 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 so tonic and dominant, depending upon where the children are developmentally and what kinds of responses I've heard from them, always ending with, ooh, ooh, wind is blowing through the trees, ooh, 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 ooh. autumn time is. So, like I said earlier, I was never asked to create my own music until I was a doctoral student, believe it or not. And by then, having my own musical expressions and ideas was really scary because we had learned to be so critical and judgmental of whether things were correct, right or wrong, in tune or out of tune, rhythmically correct, that I was so scared to offer my own ideas because your own ideas are personal. There's something that's really important to you and that, that are really important to you. So we need to give children the opportunities to create from the very beginning, when it's just part of music class, when it is just like when you speak to kids, they're not afraid mostly to speak or answer a question that you ask. If we start asking them musical questions, if we start giving them opportunities to create and respond in our environments, the creative process will be part of what is normally part of musical, music instruction and will be empowering them. We've already empowered them with syntactical structures, with vocabulary, but now we want to give them an opportunity to use those two things to express themselves musically. So one of the things that you may have noticed in my pattern instruction is I provided lots and lots and lots of silence in between. Because in those silences is when children tend to respond and make sounds. We as music teachers have often been so focused on filling the environment with sound at all times that we don't leave space for the children and for the children's own ideas. 
and I want to show them that I value that I, those ideas, and I want to give them an opportunity to make sounds that are their own rather than just mine. So I might use this song, putting a beanbag in my hand. Bum, 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 bum. So I dump the beanbag on the ground on tonic and bum, 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 have them just pat it. Now that's an anticipatory silence because the children were anticipating what I was about to do. They'd probably done the activity enough that they knew that after the beanbag's on your hand, we dump it on the ground and bum, 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 bum sing tonic. So that's one way of leaving silence. Um, but there are, I often will leave silence like after the patterns that's not anticipatory, but just space in which a child can make a sound. And maybe if I had gone ba 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 in the patterns and the child went ba, I would echo that child's sound. Ba. And leave space and look at that child. They may do something else, and then I would echo that, and we would go back and forth, or they may do nothing. And then I might go, ba, 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 Using their little cell of a response as a core of something that I'm creating and improvising based on their sounds. And I have found that when I do that, children will look at me intently until I'm done using their little piece. And then they'll sort of do what everybody else is doing. But they recognize that piece is theirs. So valuing their creative response. I will use my talking friends. Bum, bum, bum. These are oven mitts. <laughs> but they also talk beautifully together, my fish and my frog. So even just doing rhythm pattern conversations. And give, maybe have my assistant do these patterns with me to model them a little bit first, or have one of the parents or caregivers. And eventually, I'll let the child have one of the puppet, and we'll have a rhythm conversation. I also find that I can have kids tell me secrets. So I might tell them a tonal secret. Bum, bum, bum. And I'll say, do you have a different secret you want to tell me? And I let them sing their pattern in my ear. I find that sometimes having a quiet space in which to do that, so they're just conversing with me, elicits more responses, gives them a little bit more freedom than having to do something for the whole class. So again, I might, I'll probably do that within the context of a song. We'll tell secrets in between repetitions of that song. And I might get to two or three kids and tell them a secret and have them an opportunity, have them create something and tell me something. And I'll start teaching them same and different by using same and different hands, same and different hands. So that th these are different hands. Either of those are different hands. Those are same hands or those are same hands. And I'll ask them to give me a tonal secret that's different from mine or a tonal secret that's the same as mine. So eventually I get so that I can really have the kids 
participate in jam sessions. Listen to this song. Yum, bum, ba ba da da da, ya da 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 da, bum ba dum, bum ba da da da, bum ba da 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 da, ya da 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 da, bum ba dum, bum. So I'll teach that song, or I'll have, I'll demonstrate that song a bunch of times, and we'll walk around the room. So bum, bum, ba da da da. Then, in between repetitions of the song, I might start improvising. So I'm alternating between the song and improvising. And I invite the parents, I invite the children to begin to improvise with me. So we're having this rhythmic jam session while we're standing in one place and flowing. And the meter keeps going because I'm improvising in meter. And that provides a framework for everyone to build upon. So that alternation between the song and sort of a rhythm jam session. So, what do I hope that you take sort of from my comments today? One of the main fundamental underpinning principles of my early childhood instruction is that we need to treat music learning more like we treat language learning. Have it be informal. Have it be immersion first before formal learning. Helping them develop that sense of syntax. Introducing them to vocabulary. And giving them lots and lots of silence and opportunities to create. We want our students to be as conversant musically as they are with language. Think about how you go through your day. Every conversation that you have, every verbal interchange, is a language improvisation. And yet, I was never asked to improvise musically. Really, what we did musically was the equivalent of everyone reading a book that someone else has written together and having somebody tell us how it should be read, where should be the loud parts, what tempo should we do it at, rather than, as they do with language, writing papers, writing poetry, giving an opportunity to express their own thoughts through language. We want our students to have something to say musically to have the syntactical understanding to say it, and the vocabulary to express their musical ideas. And when we do that, I think we will create very different kinds of musicians who will feel empowered to express themselves through music. I'd like to end by having you watch a different video. And this is a video, again, of a father and a son, but this time they're interacting musically rather than through language.
look and see how meaningful this interaction is and how empowered this child is as a result of his own music making. I'd like to end with questions or comments, and thank you so much for allowing me to be with you today.